pastor this morning is going to preach a message entitled Battle Lines from Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. It'll be on the screens behind me as well. And so let's read the word of God this morning. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for allowing us to come to this time, allowing us to have your word that we can come to, that we can learn from, uh, Lord, that we can be uh, changed by. And I pray that, Lord, you will open our hearts and our minds this morning for the receiving of your word and receiving of, uh, of, of who you are. And Lord, I pray that we will apply it again to, to our lives, that we may be changed more into the image of your son. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Very Amen. Thank you, Brother Charles. Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 8 is kind of where we're going to be focusing in on this morning. And uh, I'll give you a little disclaimer. As we get into the message this morning, the message this morning is really very foundational uh, to where we're going to be going in the coming weeks. Uh, it, it, and, and I will also offer this disclaimer that the things that we're going to be talking about in the coming weeks are heavier things. And I'll tell you, I don't like to talk about heavy things any more than you like to hear about heavy things. But we need to, amen? Because the life that we live, the world that we live in, it's not all daffodils and daisies, is it? And the reality that we live as Christians is that the Lord Jesus Christ must increase in our lives, that he must be lifted up, that his grace and his glory must be proclaimed. Church, we have to live, he must increase, amen? amen. And that is the simple principle that provides a working paradigm to answer any concern I have, any confusion I face, and any conflict I'm involved in. My response and my responsibility in life is Jesus Christ and Him glorified. It really is that simple. Now, I love this passage because it very clearly teaches that you and I are complete in Him. That in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are and we have all that we will ever need. i got to tell you this morning, if you're here with us, maybe watching by way of Facebook, listening by way of radio, and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't know the, the, the joy that is found in the Lord, you don't know the forgiveness and salvation that is found in the Lord, you don't know the belonging that is found in trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, the peace, the security. I tell you, if you're here this morning without Christ, there is no greater decision that you can make this morning than to come and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. I promise you there is no one and nothing like the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can too in faith be complete in Him. You know the thing about the Christian life, we recognize that we are blessed beyond compare. But the Christian life it's not all gummy bears and lollipops. We live in a broken world. We live in a brutal world. A world whose corruption threatens to taint whatever it touches. You know, this was really the context of the book of Colossians, and especially the chapters we find ourselves in now was written. You know, the church at Colossae faced a threat. There were philosophies and, and teachers in that area and in that church who, who, who sought to, to, to tell and to draw away believers to, to think that Jesus Christ isn't God, to think that Jesus Christ isn't great, that He isn't glorious, that He isn't enough. And in response to the corruption of the world, Paul begins to draw battle lines. Because some things are worth fighting for. And some things must be fought against. 
I want to let that sink in. Some things in this life are worth fighting for. And some things in this life must be fought against. Church, we would be negligent or ignorant to think that the corruption in our culture doesn't threaten to infiltrate and corrupt the church. And we must, we must in a Christ-like way be willing and ready to fight the good fight. That which would draw us away from our identity in Christ. That which would draw us away from our sense of sufficiency in Christ. That which would draw us away from our confidence in the words of Christ. That which would draw us away from our connectedness to the body of Christ. Must be called out and must be stood against. And so today, church, it is foundational. While in weeks to come, we will talk about many of these philosophies and and corruptions in our culture that, that seek to infiltrate and undermine, today I want us to see just one reality. That if we would lift up our eyes and we would see, we would see that just like in the first century, just like at the church of Colossae, there are battle lines all around us. Would you look with me at Colossians 2? Let's look together at verse number 8, Luke. Paul writes, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men and after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. I want you to notice first this morning the raging war. The raging war. I'm going to make a statement, and I want us to allow it to sink into our hearts. You are presently, personally, and powerfully under attack today. I don't want you to think about your neighbor. I don't want you to think about your spouse. I don't don't want you to think about your, your family in general or even our church corporately. I want you to understand this morning, I need to understand this morning, that I am presently, personally, and powerfully under attack. When Paul writes here, he starts in verse number 8 with the word, beware. This isn't a spooky word. It's not the Halloween, beware. No. It's a cry to give attention. Hey, look out! Look out! If your neighbor's falling asleep, smack him and say, look out! (laughs) Beware is one of those, grab your attention. It it is, maybe we call it a a caffeinated word. It, It is both eyes wide open. And Paul here strikingly calls us to beware, to give heed, to look out, because most of us don't live that way. You know, most of us do not live feeling the raging war around us. You know, for instance, you look at certain aspects in our physical world. If you've ever flown, you know that in the airport, there is a constant warning message that is cycling over the intercom system. Watch out for suspicious people and packages and this and that. And, you know, but, but most of us, we don't even tune into that. I don't know very many people who sit at the gate and go, hmm, they look suspicious. Hmm, they look suspicious. Ooh, nobody's around that suitcase. I wonder what's going on there. We don't live with the weight of that risk. We were, at the, uh, we were down in Florida for the past week and a half or so, and uh, one of the days we were there, uh, they changed the flag from green to yellow. Now, if you know about the warning systems and the flags, you know that when it goes to yellow, you're supposed to give a little bit more caution. We were like, oh, yellow, that means bigger waves. Because most of us do not live with the weight of the war, the weight of risk in this life. And yet, from a spiritual standpoint, there is so much at stake. I want you to know this morning, church, that the enemy that we face is fierce. 
You know, our main battle, the Bible teaches, is not against flesh and blood. We, we battle our corrupt flesh. We battle the corruption of this world. I'm going to focus this morning on the devil because the devil is the father of lies. And as we look at the lies that corrupt our culture and seek to corrupt our lives, we have to understand who is ultimately behind them. You know, you look at the devil in the scripture and he's described as a serpent. He is described as a serpent. Oh. Now, you would think differently if I said, um, church, I've got bad news. John Sinclair brought his snake to church for show and tell and it got out. We don't know where it's at. I guarantee wouldn't a one of you fall asleep during my message. Because if there was a snake at loose in the church, it would change things. But the reality is, when you walk into the office, there's a serpent loose. When you get in your car and turn on the radio, there's a serpent loose. You go home and turn on your TV, there's a serpent loose. Somebody pulls out in front of you, I'll tell you, there's a serpent loose. And he fiercely desires to destroy you. The devil is described as a roaring Lion, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, we're told to be sober and vigilant because our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. He's described as a dragon, as a murderer, as a destroyer. He's described in Ephesians 6.16 as one who shoots flaming, fiery arrows at us, who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy, John 10 and verse number 10. And yet, though our enemy is fierce, most of us give more credence to beware of dog than we do beware of devil. One of my neighbors got a little tiny yappy thing. I thought it was going to get my throat the other day. You ever seen a preacher dance? I'm doing that going down the sidewalk. It was awful. You know what I did coming home, though? I walked on the other side of the street. I told myself it was because I didn't want to have to harm the dog. That wasn't true. <laughs> Christian, your enemy is fierce. He's a cunning serpent. He is a roaring lion, a dragon, a murderer and destroyer. He is a fierce adversary who has brought down far stronger than you. Who has brought down far stronger than me. Church, the war is raging. Our enemy is fierce and his engagement is focused. You know, when we talk about battle lines, we often think about the conflict that we see in the streets of our major cities. We think about the, the conflict that we see in the halls of Congress we think about the conflict that's taking place on public school boards. We think about the conflict that's taking place in African and Middle Eastern deserts. We think about conflicts all around us. But church, I got news for us this morning. All of these conflicts are secondary. Because the war that is raging primarily is the war that is raging in and for your heart and mind. The devil wants your heart and the devil wants your mind because he can, if he can get that, he's got you. You know, the Bible reminds us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 beginning in verse number 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Notice what he says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not Physical. I'm not picking up a gun and going to hunt the devil. That's not what we do. But they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Verse number 5, it says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Hey, according to verse number 5, where does this battle take place? It takes place here. And here, hear me church, we have a fierce enemy who is engaging in a focused assault on our minds and on our hearts. Why is this so important? Because you either define the battle or you ever live defeated. You either define the battle 
or you forever live defeated. That's why the Bible admonishes us over and over and over again to care for our hearts and to care for our minds. Proverbs 4 and verse number 23 puts it this way. Keep thy heart with all diligence. Guard it. Protect it. Because out of it, our heart are the issues of life. Colossians 3 verses 1 and 2, just a little bit further in the book we're studying, Paul writes, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. He says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Why in Philippians, Paul admonishes in chapter 4 and verse number 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Church, there is a battle raging. You are presently, personally, powerfully under attack. But I want you to notice this morning, not just the raging battle, I want you to also notice the ruinous weapons. If we look at Colossians 2 and verse number 8 again, Paul writes, beware. He says, lest any spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. I want you to notice this morning the ruinous weapons. Here's what we find, and here's what the Bible teaches. That our hearts and minds have been infiltrated and undermined by so many ideas. And I'm telling you, in the weeks to come, we will specifically deal with these ideas, these ideologies in the world that, that we allow in our lives that corrupt us from our completion in Christ. Corrupt ideas, corrupt. It's what they do. They are incompatible with who we are in Christ. And they are often the weapons that the enemy uses to ravage and ruin us. But I want you to see what these weapons do to us. He, he gives kind of an inkling here as he gives these words to describe these things that, that Satan uses. First he says... Beware lest any man spoil you. That word spoil has to do with being led away or being led astray. It means to kidnap or to seduce. Now why are these weapons ruinous? Their weapons are ruinous because they deceive us. Because they deceive us. Church, how many of us recognize that though Satan is a serpent, he is a lion, he is a murderer, he is a destroyer, he can also appear as an angel of light. Revelation 12 in verse number 9 describes him as the one who deceived the whole world. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11 and verse 14 describes him as being one who is able to transform himself into an angel of light. I'm going to tell you this, the weapons of Satan are ruinous because they deceive us. You know, so many live their lives thinking, I'm okay. I'm not engaged in any sort of battle. I'm not under attack. Well, I'm too smart. I'm too strong for the devil. There's no struggle here. I can handle it. Beloved, you're deceived. You're deceived. How prone are we to believe our own logic and feelings? How prone are we then to be puffed up in pride? You know what I've not met in the last year and a half? I've not met somebody who doubts their own opinion on coronavirus. I got news for you, we're not all right. I've not met somebody who doubts their opinion on masks. I've not met somebody who doubts their opinion on vaccines. I'm just, ladies and gentlemen, 
We're not all right. But here's the reality. So often, we're not even willing to admit what we don't know. And we live in prideful ignorance, being spoiled, seduced, robbed, carrying away because the weapons of Satan are deceiving us. Not only are they ruinous because they deceive us, they are ruinous because they distract us. That word philosophy that Paul mentions here, it is the love and pursuit of man's wisdom. It is arguing a case. It is a way of life. Vain deceit has to do with empty promises, things that will never fulfill, things that will never be enough, things that will never satisfy. And here's what the weapons of Satan do. The weapons of Satan distract us. You know, there are so many believers who live their lives passionately pursuing that which is empty. Have you ever watched little kids when bubbles are blown? And, and the little kids, they love it. Ooh, and they'll run, they'll run, they'll run, and it's gone. So what do they do? Sometimes they sit on the ground and cry. You're like, knock it off, kid. <laughs> Most of the time, they figure out there are other bubbles. Ooh, ah. Oh. And as long as you keep blowing bubbles, what do they do? You keep chasing. You know what, ladies and gentlemen? Sometimes the devil, I think he's just up there blowing bubbles. And the church is going, ooh, stuff. Ooh, self-love. Ooh, fulfillment. Ooh, peer esteem. Ooh, this. And we run and we run and we run and we run and we run. And the devil has robbed us blind. Because we are distracted chasing things that will never be enough. Things that will never satisfy. Things that will never fulfill. We spend our lives chasing empty things and wonder why we are left wanting more. Can I give this as an aside? I know this morning I said we're focusing on you. I know this morning we said we're focusing that you are presently, personally, powerfully under attack. But I watch all those kids leave and it breaks my heart. Because ladies and gentlemen, we are setting our kids up to chase the same stinking bubbles. Because we train them to chase a ball way harder than we train them to pursue Christ. We train them. To be technologically savvy and leave them theologically stupid. The vast majority of Christian homes spend more money, time, and allow more exposure to Disney than they do discipleship. We're chasing bubbles and we're teaching them to chase bubbles, and we wonder why it feels so empty. Because the ruinous weapons of the devil are robbing us blind and we don't even realize how bankrupt we are. The church in America today is like the church of Laodicea of old. Revelation 3 and verse number 17. The testimony is this saying, Because I am rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing. Everything's okay. And the Lord looks and said, And you don't even know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. These ruinous weapons... Ravage the church because they deceive us. They ravage the church because they distract us. They they ruin because they divide. Because they divide. You know, the tradition of men, Paul mentions here, is doing what we do because it's what we do. The rudiments of the world that Paul mentions here is doing what we do because everybody else is doing it. And we look at the things that go on in our culture, in our society, and the things that take place in our churches. And and I look at these elements that, that are becoming breaking points and dividing lines within the church. And it's not right. And it's not biblical. 
It's not biblical. God is very clear that he wants to take many and make us one. One body in Christ. You know, Jesus' high priestly player, John 17, beginning in verse 20. I want you to see the heart of Jesus. He said, as this is as Jesus, God the Son, prayed to God the Father. He said, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. He said, that they may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. And that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou hast given me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. That's incredible. The unity that you and I share should mirror, should represent, should reflect the unity of the Trinity. God's desire is to take many. Many men and women, young and old, rich and poor, of all different ethnicities, tribes and tongues, God's desire is to take many and to make them one. By the way, we're going to talk about one of these weeks. One of these philosophies that are ruining the church is this this, this racism and classism that we see all around us. We're going to talk about it and what our response biblically is. But God's desire is to take many and to make one. The devil desires to divide one into many. I'm going to tell you, church, the vast majority of things we fight about, I say it in love, the vast majority of things we fight about are so dumb. Are so dumb. A thousand years from now, we're going to look back and say, wow, that was dumb. Because at the feet of Jesus in glory, In eternity to come, the vast majority of what sticks in our crawl today ain't going to matter one bit then. Someone wisely said, an essential is unity and non-essential is charity. And yet we live in a society that so forcefully and pridefully reacts to such spiritually insignificant things. That so often we, we look at the church of Jesus Christ and we reflect the situation that Paul dealt with in Galatians 5 and verse number 15. And he said, if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed of one another. When you and I come to odds, I guarantee you this, it ain't the Spirit of God who's in control. When you and I come to odds, I guarantee this, it's not the work of Christ that's in control. It's not the grace of God that is having primary influence. Why are these weapons ruinous? Well, they deceive us. They distract us. They divide us. Ultimately, they are ruinous because they devour and destroy God's designs and desires for us. And you and I spend our time fighting men while the spiritual, cultural, emotional, and philosophical movements of this world carry us away captive. You know, Paul writes of the raging war. Paul writes of the ruinous weapons. But church, I got good news. I got good news. Because Paul didn't leave us there. Paul also told us about the righteous way. Verses 9 and 10 of Colossians chapter 2 put it this way. For in him, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Verse number 10, it says, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Yes, there is a raging war. And yes, there are ruinous weapons at work. But church, yes, there is a righteous way that you and I can walk, that the Lord Jesus Christ might increase, that his name might be glorified the war may rage and the weapons may be ruinous but we don't have to be a casualty and here's the call church that we are not called to be cowards but to be conquerors we are not called to be victims but to be victors so how are we going to do it we give you three principles that will guide us as we go through each and every philosophy in the weeks to come. Number one, church, we need to walk honestly. We need to walk 
honestly. What do you mean? I mean the danger is real. And it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me that needs to realize, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10 in verse number 12, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Walk honestly. You know what that means? That means this morning you need to be honest enough with yourself, honest enough with the Lord to say, Lord, I have blind spots. I have blind spots. You know what that means? That means you have things that you don't understand that you don't even know you don't understand. I have blind spots. You know what? We need to be honest enough to admit this morning I have baggage. I have baggage. You know what, we need to be honest enough to admit this morning that oftentimes, now this one's going to get you. This one many of you are going to bristle at and say, not me, but yeah. We need to be honest enough with the Lord to admit that I have bias that is often more cultural than Christian. In other words, more often than I like to admit, I filter my faith through my preferences. I filter my faith through my politics. I filter my faith through the pressures that I face as opposed to taking this life and filtering it through my faith. In other words, sometimes you sound a whole lot more like a Republican than a Christian. And those things aren't the same. Walk honestly. To admit that I am prone to deception. I am prone to distraction. I am prone to division. I am prone to discouragement. Walk honestly. Because here's what happens when we walk honestly. We begin to realize that though the danger is immediate, the drift is not inevitable. Why? Because Christ is still enough. Verse number 10. We are still complete in Him. But ignorance and denial will always be obstacles to victory. So how are we going to walk the righteous way? Number one, we're going to walk honestly. What is it, church? Number one, walk honestly. honestly. How are we going to walk the righteous way? Number two, walk humbly. Walk humbly. You know, there is a distinctly Christian and scriptural response to every issue. That God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. There is a distinctly Christian, Christ-like response to every Christian. Why? Why is that? Well, because Christ is enough. Verse number 10. We are complete in Him. But we can't do a right thing a wrong way. We can't do a right thing thing the wrong way. What do you mean by that? You know what? We live in a culture who is really good at rising up and letting their voice be heard. I mean, that's all social media is anymore. Everybody's rants about everything. This about this and government and, and, and politicians and, and, and COVID and, and, and my boss and, and inflation and, and we just rant. Rah, rah, rah. Everybody's just kind of raging in this world. We're really good at just kind of rising up and rah, rah. But here's the thing. As a Christian, what we have to understand is before we are called to rise up, we're called to kneel down. Before we're called to resist, we're called to submit. James chapter 4 and verse number 7 gives us the order. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submit to God. Submit to God. You know, there are some who are all about resist, resist, resist. Christian, submit. Submit. Submit to God. You know what that means? That means when I look at issues and when I come to the scriptures, I am not trying to figure out what God's word means to me. 
I'm trying to figure out what God meant when he gave me his word. It's not about what it means to me. It's about what he meant when he gave it to me. Church, God has given us light and we are without excuse. It's crazy to have a tape measure, but to ignore and reinterpret it along the way. Walk honestly. Walk humbly. And last but not least, walk holy. Walk holy. Christ is the head of all power and principalities. He, the Lord Jesus Christ, and His Word are the final authority. Whether or not it makes sense in our culture, He is the final authority. Whether or not it makes me feel good inside, He is the final authority. Whether or not I understand it, He is the final authority. Church, we don't always need to feel led. But we always need to be obedient. Walk holy. Walk holy. Walk honestly. Walk humbly. Walk holy. Walk honestly. Walk humbly. Walk holy. Holy, walk honestly. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Walk humbly. Submit to God. Walk holy. Church, there are battle lines all around us. And how deeply we need to recognize that you are presently, personally, and powerfully under attack. I'm going to tell you, church, this situation is more direct and more dire than we realize. The enemy is out to capture your heart and mind. And here's the deal. He's probably already captured more of it than we are comfortable admitting. Anytime we come to the Word of God, we always end with an invitation. This is our invitation to respond to God. And so the invitation this morning, the response to God is very simple. I wonder this morning if each of us would consciously, personally pray and ask God to help us walk honestly. You know what that's going to mean? Admitting some things about ourselves that we don't really want to admit. That's going to be asking God to, to do some things in our heart and mind that, that may be uncomfortable. One of the most dangerous prayers recorded in the scripture was offered by David in Psalm 139, beginning in verse 23. He said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. He said, and see if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way of everlasting. I'm going to tell you, if you and I want to walk honestly, we're going to have to ask God to bridge the gap for what you and I cannot do. And I wonder this morning if each of us would take time and say, Lord, I, Lord, as we look at battle lines and we look at that which is raging in our culture and seeking to carry us away, Lord, would you help me walk honestly? I wonder this morning, the second part of the invitation is that we would pray and ask the Lord to help us walk humbly. Help us walk humbly because here's the reality. Proverbs 14, 12 reminds us that there is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. To walk humbly. It's not my wants. It's not my wills. It's not my logic. It's not my feelings. It's me surrendered to God. And pray and ask the Lord to help you walk holy. I'm going to tell you, we're going to look at some big things. Some things that, that the Bible describes in 2 Corinthians 10 as strongholds of the devil. I'm going to tell you some things that we look at. It's going to seem almost overwhelming the way it's entrenched in our culture and even the way we struggle with it in our own hearts. But here's the reality as we pray and ask God to help us walk holy that we recognize as Paul wrote in Romans 8 and verse number 37 that in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And so church today we do open our eyes. We do look up, look out. Because either Jesus is worthy or he's not. Either Jesus is enough or he's not. 
Either he must increase or something else will in his stead. Hear me, church. The battle lines are drawn. And my prayer this morning is that the church of the living God stand to meet the occasion.